Our shepherd, good and true, is he who will at last his Israel free from all their sin and sorrow. Let's turn to Exodus chapter 2 and see what God's plan of deliverance was for his people. We're just going to read verses 1 to 10 at this stage. It's found in page 58 of the Pew Bibles. We'll take up the story a wee bit later on. Exodus chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. The birth of Moses. Now a man of the house of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe and her attendants were walking along the river bank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her slave girl to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. And the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this baby and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. When the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. Let's pray. So here we are to worship, here we are to bow down, here we are to say that you're our God and you're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful. Sovereign Lord, Almighty God, our Father, we worship you, the God of all history, past, present and future the great I am. We praise you, Father, for your plan of salvation and redemption. And as we see in Exodus, your deliverance through your servant Moses, we thank you that it points us to our own redeemer, our own rescuer, our saviour, the Lord Jesus. We confess, Lord, that we too can be like the children of Israel and live in disobedience or even rebellion against you. And we can be slaves to sin in our own lives, sin that so easily entangles us and prevents us from walking closely with you. But we thank you, Lord, for your forgiveness that we receive through the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, and that through his sacrificial death and the victory of his resurrection, we are accepted, forgiven, restored, no longer slaves, but free to live as your children by the power of your Holy Spirit. And Father, as we consider how the Israelites were persecuted and oppressed, we just take a moment now to remember our brothers and sisters in North Korea as that country celebrates its 70th anniversary. We know that Christians there are familiar with persecution, with bitter suffering and harsh labor. But we thank you, Lord, that you know their pain and their difficulties. You hear their cries for help. We ask that they will know your strength to endure. We ask you that their glorious future and ours too, we thank you that it's secure in the Lord Jesus. And we praise you for the hope of heaven. And so, Lord, until that day when we see you face to face, we pray, Lord Jesus, that we will live lives that will reflect your light and your goodness and your truth and your love. And all this we pray in the strong name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Um.
Um, So we're going to continue on our reading in Exodus 2, and we're going to go from verses 11 to 25. One day, after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and watched them at their hard labour. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. Glancing this way and that and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. The next day, he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? The man said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, what I did must have become known. When Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian, where he, had, where he sat down by a well. Now a priest of Midian had seven daughters. And they came to draw water and fill the troughs to water their father's flock. Some shepherds came along and drove them away, but Moses got up and came to their rescue and watered their flock. When the girls returned to rule their father, he asked them, Why have you returned so early today? They answered, An Egyptian rescued us from the shepherds. He even drew water for us and watered the flock. And where is he? he asked. Why did you leave him? Invite him to have something to eat. Moses agreed to stay with the man who gave his daughter, Sephora, to Moses in marriage. Sephora gave birth to a son, and Moses named him Gershom, saying, I've become an alien in a foreign land. During that long period, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out, and their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. All right, if you have Exodus chapter 2 open, uh, it will be uh, very, very helpful. Genesis, Exodus, and uh, we're on page uh, 58. Uh, Last week in the morning, we saw that... uh, The Hebrews, that is our ancestors in the faith, uh, the Hebrews were once honored as an esteemed uh, set of guests in Egypt, but now they're regarded as foreigners, uh, only fit for slavery. And the order is given by a cruel and wicked king that all the boys of that tribe should be separated from their parents and exterminated. Now, this, of course, is not merely a story of 3,400 years ago, only this morning. Uh, Dr. Bonini told us of the events of just 24 years ago in his native land of Rwanda, when similar dreadful things happened to infant children, as well as to hundreds of thousands of adults there. So into all of this context, we come to chapter 2, verse 1, and read this seemingly innocent sentence. Now, a man of the house of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. Gracious Lord, uh, what we are reading about is is not merely ancient history, but our story, our story with very contemporary relevance. And as we turn to your word, we pray that you will please communicate to us according to our need and according to your great purpose of grace, and all we ask is for the sake of Christ, our rescuer. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, uh, just uh, over a week ago, um, Claire and Ruth and I were were with uh, Robert in in New York, where he's he's living currently until Christmas time. And when we were there, we visited the 9-11 Memorial Museum in in the city. I I don't know, have any of you actually seen the the, the, uh, Memorial Museum downstairs? It's it's newly built. It's, It's really... My gifts. I have to confess, I didn't even know that it was there. I just thought it was the uh, uh, waterfall that was the memorial. But they've built this amazing uh, um, uh, memorial museum on the site, and it's very, very poignant. 
And this, of course, is the uh, actual anniversary week uh, of its events. But visiting the Memorial Museum brought to my mind a deep emotion that I had almost forgotten. As the Twin Towers came crashing down through the deliberate act of crazy terrorists in September 2001, Claire was pregnant at that time with Ruth. And I remember having this distinctly uh, heavy feeling, what kind of world were we bringing this child into? And if that's how I felt in 2001, how much more deeply must Amram and Jochebed bed have felt in verse 1 here when they discovered that they were going to have a baby boy at a time of shocking terror and extreme danger when the king had ordered that every baby boy should be murdered at birth. Their hearts must have been in their mouths. But God's people are called to be faith and not of fear. And so at this lowest point in Israel's history, Moses' parents believed that their child had actually been born in order to be a blessing, not harm to a world of trauma and pain. That our children who are born in difficult times are born to bring hope when all around us there is absence of joy. That's what all Christian parents must believe too. Our children are given in order to bring hope and life and liberation to this world traumatized and dark and difficult as it is. And so we read, when she could hide him no longer, this baby's mother, verse 3, placed her child in a wee boat and set him carefully among the reeds among the bank of the river Nile. I wonder if you remember last Sunday morning we said that Exodus is a continuation of the book of Genesis. And in Genesis chapter 6, there was a man called Noah who built a big boat. And he coated it with pitch. And that ark became like a symbol of rescue and of salvation. And it, here we have the same. Here is a little boat covered with pitch. It's a place of safety and liberation for one God had set his mark upon in order to set his people free. Well, this wee boy just happened to be crying as Pharaoh's daughter, of all people, just happened to be in this particular place bathing. And with Moses watching sister uh, close by, her heart must have been in her mouth. What was going to happen? The princess sent her slave girl to fetch the basket, and she could well have said, well, my dad has said all these wee boys have to be killed. But the scriptures tell us that she felt sorry for the infant child. And what we read here has to be one of the truly lovely stories in the Bible. The baby boy's sister Miriam, who had been charged to watch over her baby brother, uh, popped out of the reeds and with courage and ingenuity said to the princess, um, Your Royal Highness, would you like one of the Hebrew women to nurse this wee baby for you? And she said yes. And Miriam, of course, went off and got her mummy. And the daughter of Pharaoh, who had ordered the execution of uh, the Hebrew boys, ended up paying the mother of this little Hebrew lad to look after her very own lad. It's beautiful. But then God is beautiful. And we remember that God's promises are always fulfilled. If God wants to rescue his people from slavery and take them to a land of promise, 
then he needs to rescue his chosen rescuer for the deadly intentions from the deadly intentions of a wicked king. There's wonderful, something beautiful, by the way, as well, uh, how we remember how the infant Lord Jesus, the liberator, was also rescued from the clutches of the evil king Herod. But on that occasion, he was taken by his parents from the promised land and taken to Egypt out of harm's way. Whereas, of course, here it was the other way around. And so while Pharaoh intended to do harm, as it says in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, when Joseph spoke to his rebuked and repentant brothers, so here God used Pharaoh's very own daughter to bring about good. Harm was intended, but God brought about good in order to accomplish what he wanted to do, the saving of many lives. And so it came that Moses, because that's how he came to be known, you see in verse 10, was educated as a prince of Egypt. It is rather wonderful, isn't it? God provides a literary and a linguistic and legal education for one of the Hebrew boys free of charge. Israel's future lawgiver and recorder of her earliest history and the man destined to confront, humble, and defeat another pharaoh is reared in the very royal household of a king. Could Amram and Jochebed ever have foreseen this? Of course not. But simply by living their lives and fulfilling their roles with integrity and faith, God permitted them the joy of participating with him in his great purposes of salvation and grace. And so we read in verse 11, one day after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and watched them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, and again, do you see how it's described as the Hebrews are one of his own people? In the book of Hebrews, in that great chapter of faith, Hebrews chapter 11, we read these powerful words, by faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be ill-treated along with the people of God rather than enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 26, of greater value than all the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. So to identify with the Hebrews was to identify with the people of God, and to identify with the people of God was to identify with Christ. I remember talking to a student who went off to university, and at that specific moment in time, he wasn't sure if he wanted to get involved with the Christian Union or not. But he said that as he wandered around the Freshers' Fair, bombarded on all sides by every conceivable club, interest, or society you could ever imagine, it suddenly hit him. These Christians are my people. These are the people he wanted to identify with. And that, that decision, by the way, shaped not only his college career, but arguably the rest of his life. When faced with a choice of the privileges of power and the pleasures of sin for a short time, as Hebrews 11.25 puts it, or to opt for or identify with the people of God, Moses chose Christ. And it's not our decision as well, every day, to choose Christ, refuse one way of life in favor of another, to turn our back on the fleeting pleasures and embrace instead eternal joys. And so, by faith, Moses left Egypt and persevered through long years of obscurity 
in Midian. Now that whole process wasn't without its complications, as you can see, because Exodus 2 verse 12 gives us an insight into a very unfortunate incident indeed. We're told there that glancing this way and that, seeing no one, Moses killed the Egyptian who was acting aggressively towards the Hebrew slave, and Moses hid him in the sand. But Moses, you see, had to learn that God's plan to rescue the Hebrews had to be fulfilled in God's way. And God's purposes had to come about according to God's methods, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord, Zechariah 4. And so before Moses could become the leader God could use, Moses had to learn to submit his unrighteous passion for righteousness to the lordship of Christ's righteous passion for righteousness. Moses had to learn to be a servant before he could be a master. He had to be trained how to become a prophet instead of a a prince, to be a friend of God rather than a friend of Pharaoh. And so, in a process that must have been deeply painful for Moses, humiliating even, God stripped Moses of all the advantages he'd been used to for the first 40 years of life, and Moses began his apprenticeship in spiritual leadership. He was sent off to Midian, in the middle of nowhere, where he would learn the skills of shepherding sheep before he could shepherd his people. Some of you will know the 19th century American evangelist called D.L. Moody, and he once said, Moses spent his first 40 years thinking he was a somebody. He then spent the second 40 years in the backside of the desert, realizing he was a nobody, spending the last 40 years of his life discovering what God can do with a nobody for the sake of somebody. And this second part of chapter 2 then shows us how that process of transformation began to happen in Moses' life. From urban prominence, Moses ended up in rural obscurity, so that in God's providence, Moses could lead his people out of the city and through the desert. But this deliverance would not be by his hand, It would not be by his might, not by his strength, not by his goodness or anything else, but by God's power. I wonder if that makes sense. Can you along with me recognize that as often in our experiences of weakness and fragility and humility and vulnerability that God is able to use us rather than in our inflated and arrogant supposition that God is really very lucky to have me. And so it was that the servant of the Lord left the glories of his royal existence to suffer a fate he did not deserve so that in turn he might set his people free. Will I say that again except in a slightly different way? The servant of the Lord left the glories of his royal existence in order to suffer a fate he did not deserve so that we in turn, as his people, might be set free. And so we have this lovely story of Moses coming to the aid of these seven daughters of Ruel. Have have any of you ever come across the name Ruel before? Mark? Do you know anybody by the name of Ruel? J.R.R. Tolkien. Yeah? Uh, J.R.R. Tolkien, Professor John Ronald Ruel Tolkien. There we go. So here we have, Ruel is sometimes known as Jethro. And uh, Moses uh, comes to the aid of these uh, seven girls. Uh, They had been taken advantage of by some shepherds. We see that in verse 17. And Moses, uh, this man of justice, he watered uh, the uh, women's flocks And then, of course, uh, when they went home, 
their dad said, well, why didn't you bring him home? You know, I mean, he's done you a favor. We have to give him hospitality. Came home, ended up marrying one of the daughters, uh, Zipporah. And they had a wee boy called Gershom, which means I've become an alien in a foreign land. During which long time, in verse 23, we see the king of Egypt died and the Israelites groaned in their slavery. They cried out. They cried out for help because their slavery was very, very sore. And this cry, we're told, went up to God. And then verse 24, we have this marvelous, wonderful verse, uh, which we we finish on tonight. Uh, Katie mentioned it. Within the context of dangerous uh, suffering and genocide and pain, what is it we're told? God heard their groaning. He remembered his covenant with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. God looked upon the Israelites and he was concerned about them. God heard, he remembered, he looked, he was concerned, God cared. The actual word used here in verse 25 is simply this, God knew. Can I tell you something? God knows about your situation. He knows. God knows. That's all you need to know. Maybe that's the only thing you need to know tonight. God knows. That's what it says. The God who amazingly and astonishingly brought about the birth of this little baby boy and protected him in chapter 2, verse 1, at this most terrible and dangerous period in the Hebrew people's history, and who worked to have this vulnerable child protected for and nurtured by his mummy before being adopted by Pharaoh's daughter, knew. This God who raised up Moses from the Nile to the palace so that he could be a prince of Egypt and then humbled him as a shepherd in Midian, this God of the book of Exodus knew about his people's needs and cared. He heard, he remembered, he saw, and he was concerned enough to prepare a rescuer in order to bring about deliverance for his people Israel. That very same God has come to us in Jesus. and comes for us tonight. Our Heavenly Father, this is just wonderful. Thank you for all that we have enjoyed from your word, recorded for us, from so many centuries ago in order to lift our hearts, in order to grant us a lightness of spirit so that in this terrible and dangerous and difficult and tragic world in which we live, we may live as people of faith and not fear, knowing that you're God who knows, who cares, who understands. So, our gracious Father, we entrust one another to you Uh, in this coming week and ask that you will be in charge of our lives and in our world and what we pray is for Christ's glory. Amen.